The City Planners The City Planners by the Canadian poet and author Margaret Atwood is about man's desire to make everything in life clean, controlled and constructed, and how our aversion to life's chaos and our thirst for order is actually a form of madness, because life's just not like that. The poem also raises interesting ideas about the environment and mankind's abuse of the planet. I'll read through the poem now, but you can skip over this bit to the analysis if you've read it recently. The City Planners. Cruising these residential Sunday streets in dry August sunlight, what offends us is the sanities, the houses in pedantic rows, the planted sanitary trees, a certain levelness of surface like a rebuke to the dent in our car door. No shouting here or shatter of glass, nothing more abrupt than the rational whine of a power mower cutting a straight swathe in the discouraged grass. But though the driveways neatly sidestep hysteria by being even, the roofs all display the same slant of avoidance to the hot sky. Certain things, the smell of spilled oil, a faint sickness lingering in the garages, a splash of paint on brick surprising as a bruise, a plastic hose poised in a vicious coil, even the too fixed stare of the wide windows give momentary access to the landscape behind or under the future cracks in the plaster, when the houses, capsized, will slide obliquely into the clay seas, gradual as glaciers that right now nobody notices. That is where the city planners, with the insane faces of political conspirators, are scattered over unsurveyed territories concealed from each other, each in his own private blizzard, guessing directions, they sketch transitory lines, rigid as wooden borders, on a wall in the white vanishing air, tracing the panic of suburb order in a bland madness of snows. The city planner's title makes me visualise men with clipboards or at a computer, measuring out and planning some sort of grid system city, like Milton Keynes in the UK or Adelaide in Australia. It creates a picture of highly organised people who construct the way we live our lives by setting out our road systems, deciding where our schools are situated and where communal areas will be located, etc. Note that these planners are faceless and unnamed, and later in the poem this will come to seem sinister. However, as we move into the first stanza, notice all the diction choices which combine to create a casual, relaxed tone or atmosphere. For instance, the verb cruising, driving around, Sunday, traditionally a day of rest, and the streets are bathed in sunlight, it's August, summertime. There's gentle sibilance, we notice that S alliteration, but it's quite lispy and relaxing, not too close together and condensed, not sinister or sickly. There's enjambment too where many of the poetry lines roll into the next without end stop punctuation, reinforcing the relaxed mood of the initial few lines. However, in the lines what offends us is the sanities, the sibilance suddenly becomes less gentle and more obvious, and a couple of words stand out. Offends is quite a negative word. If we take offence, we're upset by something, and it's the sanities which upset us. Notice the collective pronoun here, us, suggesting that we are all affected by this problem, we're all part of one community. Sanities is a strange word and therefore it stands out. It means saneness, what the poetic voice is saying. As everything in the city or suburb of this poem is too sane, too ordered, too pedantic. And it's as if there's no room for difference, individuality or creativity. The houses are in neat, ordered rows so are the trees. There's something unsettling about the way the trees don't seem natural. They're linked with the houses through the plosive sounds in the adjectives used to describe them. The houses are in pedantic rows. The trees are planted. Notice the P sound, popping sound. They're also described as sanitary, a word which sounds like sanities, which came a couple of lines earlier. Sanitary means perfectly clean, and that's an odd way to describe nature. We start to get the idea that the city planners are trying to control and manipulate nature to create a new, sterile and managed environment. Man versus nature is a big theme in poetry, 
You may have seen it in some of the other poems you studied. And of course, it's a very relevant theme in our lives today as we grapple with the issues of climate change, plastic pollution, etc. This poem was written in 1964, but Margaret Atwood was certainly a woman ahead of her time. All of this order or levelness is described by the poetic voice as being like a rebuke to the dent in our car door. A rebuke is a telling off or criticism. And we see that in this ordered world, the dent, presumably caused by a prang or an accident, isn't level or sanitary, but it's a reminder of what real life is like. It isn't always ordered or perfect, and sometimes it involves chaos or even accidents. In the final lines of this stanza, we get a more detailed picture of the suburb. It's very quiet. The caesura, the semicolon after shatter of glass, creates a little pause to emphasize the quiet. We wonder where the people are. No shouting here. Everything seems orderly and the power mower is personified in an oxymoronic manner as being both rational and whining. The vowel sounds, the O oh and the ow in the noun power mower, reinforce the idea of it having a miserable, mournful whine. We can imagine the perfect lawns, but the grass is described using the adjective discouraged. The personification here creates an image of nature giving up. The second stanza begins with the conjunction but. And we can see in the stanza that although everything looks ordered and perfect, it isn't actually when you scratch the surface. So let's take a look at this line by line. But though the driveways neatly sidestep hysteria by being even, the driveways are regular, even, not out of kilter, disorganised, erratic or mad in any way, hysteria is avoided, order is in place. Now hysteria is a key word in this poem. Margaret Atwood is a feminist who has written numerous novels and essays on women's issues and women's place in society, most notably The Handmaid's Tale. So she'd be very aware of the significance of using this particular word. In fact, the word hysteria originates from the Greek hystera, which means womb. And in the 18th and 19th centuries, hysteria came to be particularly associated with madness or depression or any kind of socially subversive odd behaviour by women. Even now, we're more likely to describe women as hysterical rather than a man being hysterical. Perhaps through using this word, Atwood is criticising the way we like to label and order and construct things. The city planners construct a suburb and therefore the way we live our lives. We've also historically socially constructed what it means to be a woman in patriarchal society. Note that the they in the poem turn out to be male. Later on you'll spot the pronoun his, each in his own private blizzard. Now that's quite a complex point, but there are other more obvious things to say about this poem. For example, hysteria, wine, sickness, bruise, they're all words associated with illness or poor mental health, and they combine to create a negative atmosphere in the poem. Now, despite the best efforts of the city planners to order every last detail, there are some little incidences of chaos. Look at the description of spilled oil. This, this is described as a sickness, and it could be a metaphor referring to all the problems that we've had with oil. It has been a type of sickness. It's fueled more than our cars. It's fueled wars. It's led to climate change. There have been tragic oil slicks. Look also at the simile describing the paint as a bruise. You get a bruise if you're hurt by accident or violence, and there's a threat, a sense of threat in this image. The metaphor of the plastic hose in a vicious coil makes simple domestic items, such as a hose, seem deadly and threatening, like a snake. And there's personification, too, of the windows. They've got a two-fixed stare, making them seem wide-eyed with madness. The figurative language listed here combines to make the suburbs seem really dystopian. Most of this poem is written in the present tense, but in the third and fourth stanzas, we get a brief glimpse into the future. 
The poetic voice refers to future crags and houses that will capsize, making us think of sinking ships or images of subsidence as the houses slide into clay seas. The semantic field of the sea, and specifically the simile describing the way the houses will slip away as gradual as glaciers, describes how slowly the suburbs will collapse and gives a sense of impermanence to the man-made environment. It also makes us think of those horrific images of polar bears on ice caps in a melting Arctic and surely references climate change. At this point in the poem, the poetic voice is hinting that ultimately, sometime in the future, there will be consequences for man's behaviour. As I mentioned, this poem was written in 1964, but we are beginning to see and feel climate change nowadays. The tragedy of human ignorance is shown in the alliterative line, right now nobody notices. We've known about climate change and habitat destruction for decades, but we've done very little to stop it. In fact, we've stuck our head in the sand and ignored it. In the next stanza, the tone becomes mocking. The eponymous city planners are mentioned again. Note the capitalization here. It's as if they are known only by their title, like it's their name. Perhaps it also emphasizes the sense of their self-importance. They may think they're important, but here they're also presented as mad and untrustworthy. They're planning and they're plotting. They're described as conspirators. Conspirators take part in a conspiracy, which is a secret plan to do something harmful or unlawful. This extends the idea of the planners attacking nature as a dictator might attack a place. They're presented here as a negative force. The verb concealed, hidden, is also quite sinister. And the suggestion is that each of these men are in a private blizzard. This is a metaphor which hints at their myopia, their short-sighted behaviour. We certainly have had a short-sighted approach to our environment. The blizzard image presents the city planners as oblivious to the harm they're doing, just set on a, a path to destruction. What is also quite disturbing is that they are scattered over unsurveyed territories. The adjective unsurveyed suggests that the planners are not watched, regulated or stoppable. You will probably have noticed a lot of oxymoronic phrases in this poem, which contribute to the disturbing dystopian effect, such as sanitary trees and rational wine, and this continues into the penultimate and final stanzas. The lines that the city planners draw are transitory, they will not last, but yet they're also described as rigid, making them seem unyielding. In the final stanza we have bland madness, and if something is bland, it's boring and dull, the opposite of crazy and chaotic. So this is also an oxymoron. We can see that the whole poem, which initially seemed about humanity trying to impose order on the natural world, is actually full of words and images which suggest contradiction and chaos. The gentle W alliteration before and in the image of a wall of in the white vanishing air extends the chaotic blizzard metaphor. It's also an image of the intense natural beauty that can come from disorder. In the last stanza, the verb tracing describes the city planners drawing out their plans and this links with the idea of transitory lines. The planners are making faint marks on paper and on nature. We end with the natural image of snows. It's plural, suggesting plenty of it, and it reinforces the idea that nature will fight back. Looking at the form and structure of the poem briefly, we can see that there are structured aspects to the poem. It's organised into stanzas, which decrease in length as the poem progresses, but it also has quite loose elements. For example, there's no set rhyme scheme. The poem's written in free verse. This gives a sense of freedom and movement to the poem rather than rigid control. There are also loads of examples of enjambment, again supporting the idea of lack of control. But then there's also sudden end stop punctuation or even caesura, such as that semicolon after shatter of glass. 
The caesura disturbs the pace of the poem and makes it feel like it's more abrupt or disjointed. So even the form of the poem contains order and disorder, just like life. Which themes do we notice in this poem? Well, obviously order and chaos and man versus nature, but also repression, the repression of individuality and creativity. There's also the danger of conformity, the threat of climate change, the damage caused by striving for perfection, the idea of madness and sanity, and I'm sure you could think of many more. This is a brilliant but complicated poem, too difficult to sum up briefly, but if I had to, I'd say it's about nature and how man tries to control nature and how that in itself is unnatural and even a type of madness. Thank you so much for listening and if you found this video helpful, please do give it a thumbs up.